During a recent game scouting binge, I stumbled upon a PlayStation title I'd never even seen before. It was a strategy RPG with monster collecting elements, and it was localized. Well, relatively speaking. Not once had I even heard a whisper of this potentially hidden gem, so I grabbed a copy and very quickly discovered why. To say Eternal Eyes is a bad game is very true, but it's not an experience to be dismissed so quickly. To fully document why it chugs cum by the chalice fall, we're gonna have to go deep, 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 deep. If I had to summarize it in a single word, it'd be spacious, as each component is about as disconnected as you can possibly make them without being entirely separate games. For starters, the story can't maintain a consistent path or theme. It opens with a brief expository shot of the Japanese Badfella Collective resurrecting an evil goddess and mercilessly disposing of a man standing in their way. From here, there's a whiplash-inducing thrust to a band of young spelunkers who stumble upon a mystical treasure. They return home with the spoils, and the wall of their house explodes, exposing a hidden puppet craft room, which prompts them to discover the secrets surrounding Japetophile's hidden lab. I say the group does things, but the group don't do shit. They're conveniently written out of every story segment because they don't participate in combat, which is pretty much all the game is. The second there's even a hint of adversity, the protagonist is abandoned by his sister, his supposedly warrior friend, and the nerd. Being relegated to little more than a pep talk at the start of each chapter, their reduced presence actually works to the game's benefit, as the dialogue is barely English, and the less of that I gotta read, the better. Anyway, so it turns out our hero is from a clan of warriors who could manifest monsters by lobbing gems at toys for five-year-olds. That's not playful wording either, the canonical method for producing companions is to overarm crystallized monster wasted puppets, and to really cement how set they were on that concept, your pitching ability is a core function of combat. Returning home, the Kingdom of Gross is under siege, under lockdown, and US Marines are coming to save Prince Harry, among other things. Despite a coup being staged, the town hasn't changed at all, outside of minor NPC dialogue. And our hero was summoned by the princess, so he busts in, fights the monsters, and the one time his sister shows up, she gets murdered by the bad dude. The next few quests after this are pissfarting around to bring her back to life, which kinda works perfectly and everything goes back to normal, which is very convenient for my JRPG narrative progress. Following this, the gang tracks down a fairy who informs them that their parents are still alive, only in puppet form, and that you've got to cross the seas to stop the goddess of destruction reviving, and also rescue the princess who got kidnapped and brought your sister back to life. In an effort to do just that, the hero ascends a tower and slaps the fuck out of all the guys from the opening cinematic as they spew a handful of throwaway lines about nothing, really. At the top, you beat the generically evil fella who killed your still-living sister, only for him to flee in an attempt to revive the evil goddess, but Moomy and Duty Puppet show up to stop him. They do some Sailor Moon prism power bullshit and still get slapped down, so you kill the guy in a cutscene, which prompts the revival of the moon goddess, naturally, and then she dies in a couple hits and says some inane gurgling shit. And that's the entire story over like a 20-something hour game. What can you really say other than, I'm glad Jim Henson didn't live to see this because he probably would have fucking loved it, the weird bastard. <laughs> Most of the cutscenes are incredibly short, I'm talking 10 lines of dialogue or so, with some villains even refusing to explain anything because they assume the hero will be dead soon. It is strange how many times you see villains talk about how pointless it is to explain motivations only to immediately monologue their life story. At least this game sticks to its word, I'll give it that. And really, the plot's so generic, not much is missed from having these worn beats simplified, but I do wish they applied that approach to the rest of the game, because it is painfully slow. I legitimately almost cancelled this video because of how bored I was, and like, JRPGs are my genre of choice. In my spare time, for my YouTube thing, when I'm trying to escape from the world, I escape into a JRPG, right? It's called autism, look it up. But this game is so fucking boring. It's so boring. The biggest offender is hands down the load times, which bleed into other aspects to make one hell of a sludgy fucking slog of a game. Being a fan of PS1 era RPGs, I've seen many a paint drying game, but felt my brain retarding alongside this one. It was, it was something else. Your first interaction is moving around town at a brutally slow pace. The walk speed is practically unusable, and the run isn't much faster, even less so if you're moving diagonally, as for some reason your bloke runs at half speed. Luckily, movement can be bypassed entirely with the menu, as you can teleport to locations of interest, but even then, it forces a load screen between each map. This warp can't be used inside houses, which means you've got to leave them, shoulder a load screen, warp to your second destination, and cop a second load screen. 
But the game's so bare bones, they should have just cut movement entirely and made it a solely menu-based game. With the cream of the tactics genre, you know, Tactics Ogre and less good games, keep the focus on the gameplay and rudimentary map interactions, so what are we doing here guys, come on. Eternal Eyes loads so frequently, and each time it does you get a neat little notification that overlays on whatever you're doing. Okay, so, how do I collect monster? Well, after the first dungeon, the player's granted three plain old puppets, which do nothing until they're embedded with the monster remains you collected from said dungeon. The primary types are colour variants, which represent an element or property. For example, green jewels generally create softer boys focused around healing. And the subtypes seem like more of a way to get around how few colours there are. Within each colour lies four subtypes. Holy, Beast, Wisdom and Power. And unless you're charting this shit, it's mostly a guessing game as to what you'll actually get. Despite only featuring a total of 24 unique jewels, there's quite a decent selection of Monster Bros, 169 to be exact, which is quite a lot for such a short, easy game where that many is not sneeded. Granted, a few palette swaps here and there, but ultimately an impressive roster. Using gems on already manifested puppets can evolve them at certain levels, with some monsters capable of evolution up to three or four times. In addition to evolution, jewels can be used to teach new magics or grant permanent stat increases, neither of which are particularly useful. The healing spells were nice, but it felt like magic damage would always underperform melee, and certain monsters had a ranged attack that would clean up due to how overpowered equipment was. The protagonist has a weapon and an armor slot, but monster friends have an entirely separate inventory in that they can only equip up to two accessories. The main fella has an entire armory at his disposal, with swords, spears, bows, etc, which all have decent utility in their variants, but puppets are solely equipped for stat increases, and my god, do they give stat increases. Up until the final two chapters, my basic monsters were one-shotting every enemy because of how high their stats were. Combat allows up to three fellas to accompany the protagonist, which is handy as if he falls, it's game over. Luckily, your puppet companions are quite expendable, as dying in combat reverts them to their base puppet state, which can't participate in combat, but can be kickstarted to make a magical re-entry. If you chuck a jewel at a puppet during combat, it becomes a new monster, and this can be done as long as you're packing monster waste. With a total maximum capacity of 216 jewels, if you keep your main bloke alive, there's not much to worry about. Especially seeing as puppets themselves retain experience, so if you're rocking a level 80 puppet and spawn a new monster mid-combat, it's still level 80. The only real drawbacks is that your equipment's removed and all learned magics are forgotten, but again, magic's pretty useless. Experience also pays out by the truckload, as the game's short and effectively just a string of battles, so enemies always outlevel you and pay around half a level per hit if you're not going out of your way to grind. There's also an end of combat bonus which grants you extra free experience. Because of this, difficulty isn't really a thing, as the game goes out of its way to power level you, so even unlocking extra puppets and leveling them up for whatever reason doesn't take too long. Honestly, the hardest part of this game is not turning it off after the first few chapters. It is a slog, and the combat is painstakingly slow. Outside of all the loading, turns just take a long time, despite very little actually occurring. It doesn't help that the menus aren't particularly responsive, so it's kind of hard to mash through your turns to speed them up. It's just really tedious. Now to be fair, your puppet mates can be set to automatically take their turns, which is a bit faster, but the I in AI stands for I want to die. They spend a lot of time clearing the field of chests, and often prioritizing them, which is a horrible way to play when you're actively being hounded by living foes. Upon death, enemies drop chests, which have the same properties as characters in that they can't be moved over, even by flying monsters. The maps are quite small, and because of the higher focus on physical bouts and the low mobility of most units, skirmishes tend to cluster, which leaves fields rich with loot. And that might sound great, but within only a few turns you'll find the arena bottlenecked by hordes of chests that you've got to blow turns on to get through, which adds more unnecessary time to the game. Area of effect magic can't clear them either, which proves that this game was made by Satan. If I felt like my characters were progressing in a meaningful fashion, or there were any interesting story threads to follow, the speed wouldn't be such a big issue, but the fact that it's all occurring for practically nothing makes it that much harder to stomach. Map design's also dog shit. Think of the most generic arena you can possibly imagine, and that's every single map. To be fair, some of the visual elements are quaint and varied, but if you're inside of a building, some intrusive elements such as pillars are rendered on the backside too, which makes it pretty hard to see past the bigger assets. There's also some really weird omni-elevated squares which flat out cannot be interacted with. 
You can't move characters to them, you can't target them, you can't even position your cursor on them, which is so weird. It just acts like they're not there and glides straight past, all because they're slightly askew. In the already small arenas with the already pretty big bottlenecks, this is horrible. So your impression of Eternal Eyes right now might be pretty negative, but being the champ that I am, I powered through the entire game just to see if it gets any better. And it doesn't.